Hello, I'm Chip Alexander, and this is the Implemented Podcast. This is the first episode after vacation. August will be a busy month with two planned episodes per week. As usual, I would greatly appreciate your feedback provided directly on Twitter or LinkedIn. And if you enjoyed this episode, a five-star rating on your preferred podcast platform. The topic of this episode is AI in the industrial manufacturing space and will feature an interview with Henry Guo from Petrium. Before we start, I will share a few off-topic thoughts from my vacation travels. I visited two countries and several airports in Europe. Here, COVID situation in many countries appears under control. Countries that rely on tourists and open up expect no more than 50% capacity. As a tourist, this is great. We are able to see some popular spots without the usual crowds. Traveling safely appears to be possible with the known rules in place, masks and social distancing. Initially, we are very concerned. In the end, we are very happy we traveled. Despite our positive experience and some early good signs for tourism, I feel that most people will skip international travel this year. The international tourist cohorts do not seem to pick up significantly for the rest of the summer. I hope you are able to enjoy the summer and get some well-deserved vacation, no matter where you decide to spend it. In this episode, I cover AI in the industrial space with Henry Guo from Petuum. Petuum, short for Perpetuum, was founded by Dr. Eric Shing. He is currently a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and is ranked as the number one computer science researcher in the world. Petuum is one of the best funded AI startups and focuses on AI for the industrial space. Henry leads marketing, product marketing and pricing at Petuum and I thoroughly enjoyed his passion for the topic. We start our conversation with the origin and the mission of Petuum. Petuum focuses on AI for autonomous, supervised steering of manufacturing operations. We'll discuss why this is important for clients, its benefits and implementation considerations. I even left in a fascinating example from the airline space because the solved problem has many similarities to other industries. Without further ado, we'll let Henry introduce himself and Petuum. Afterwards, I will be back with my key takeaways on AI in the industrial space. My name is Henry Goa, lead marketing and part of marketing and pricing at Petrum. Petrum is a global AI company. It was founded in 2016. It was founded by our chief scientist officer and chairman, Eric, Dr. Eric Shing. He's a professor of AI and computer science at Carnegie Mellon Universities. He's one of the top global researchers in AI. When they started this company, one time Dr. Shing was at a sabbatical at Facebook and he was doing a lot of data crunching and using machine learning. He found a bottleneck and he pondered this problem. Even he added more resources, it was still taking a long, long time to process all this, both structured and unstructured data. So he went back and that was one of the projects they did. They looked into how do you actually solve this bottleneck? How do you break down the barriers of AI just to not have it be concentrated in the Googles, Amazons, Microsofts, Alibabas, Tencents of the world, the global AI powerhouses. You know, you kind of have the AI and the future looking haves and have nots. You have the Facebooks and Google's really adopting AI, TensorFlow, PyTorch, everything kind of developing from them and they're keeping it within the house. But then how do you allow other folks, the ones who really need it as well, like the Johnson Controls, the Semexes, the oil and gas companies of the world to really take AI and utilize it for themselves so you can equalize and make AI available for all and the research they did was a parallel machine learning research where he looked into how do you actually make that faster. So it was distributed machine learning and distributed data processing. And that allowed it to be about 100 times at the time, back in 2016, 2017, faster in data training than previously. And he talked to a lot of his advisors and friends within the technology space in Silicon Valley and felt, okay, this is a company that can actually built around it. So from there, we grew to about over 100 some, something odd people at Zenix. The amazing thing about this company is we had about, I would say, 35 to 40% top PhD AI researchers from like Johns Hopkins, 
mostly from the United States. One of our product managers from UK, from Oxford as well. I mean, all these very, very top people came in together from AI because of Dr. Eric Shing's vision and his reputation. Henry, industrial space is extremely complex. On the one Mm. hand, there are many processes from product development, manufacturing, logistics to support, very different for uh, each industrial vertical. There is also a significant amount of data coming from a huge variety of connected products, sensors, assets, processes that must be analyzed. What do you see the most promising opportunities and use cases for using AI in the industrial space? Great, good question, Chip. Industrial space, we see the most promising, really, our final phase is called autonomous supervised steer. So AI-driven asset control and processes where you string together multiple assets. We talk about assets we're talking about in cement, like multi-thousand, hundred thousand dollar, multi-million dollar coolers, kins, in oil and gas, we're talking the batch processors. Right now, when we talk to our customers, you're absolutely right. Large volumes of disparate data, incomplete. How do you clean it up? That's one of the major, that's one of the biggest problems and where we spent a lot of our time is just that data cleaning, tagging, and making sure it's ready. And I'll go a little bit more into to detail about that later. And then the second one is just the inconsistent environment. It's very haphazard. One factory is very different from the other and safety is the number one concern. We wanna make sure we improve our yield of our customer's product, save overall our energy and cost, and that's our main drivers, and then stabilize. We don't want too much fluctuation in the daily operations. So we wanna keep these constraints. But the major one we see is how do you drive these assets. And part of that is two factors. One, these are like very expensive machines and very complicated. And you're saying every few seconds, you're having a new data source. How do you take that and optimize it across time? And second phase of that is there is a resource churn in, in training, at least in North America and Europe. That's where a lot of our current customers are. Why I say that is that's a very standard churn as people leave and, and join. But at least in North America and Europe, when we hear talk to customers is a lot of the operators are 50, 60, sometimes even 70 years old. They've been doing this for 30 plus years and they are become experts in their field. But we don't see a huge pipeline for younger 20, 30 year olds who maybe didn't have this opportunity who go in, get a education and come in and join these factory operating. So there is a skill gap between very the older, more very, very strong experts and then a lesser pipeline of newer, younger blood And they're usually using AI, not so much for any replacement, but augmentation. How do you take all that learning from the older experts and transfer that and allow the newer folks to operate just as good, if not higher capacity? And that's what we've seen. So we did the research, look back into our data. Operators are usually about 50, 60 optimization level. And then with an APC or advanced process control, they get a little bit higher, about 60, 70. With us, we're looking at 70, 80. Another five to 10% higher than that at the optimization level. And beyond that, we don't want to touch too much because we actually do set safety constraints that we don't want to go above. So we work with our customers. We go in, talk with them. What do you feel safety constraint about? We understand then the assets. How much strain can we put on it? How much do we want to put optimize it? So then what we do is we take a lot of the volume of data and that mostly right now our product focus on time series, but we actually have recently added on another component called computer vision. Where we're taking actual unstructured images and augment some of the decision-making in these process controls. But right now, most of our focus, about 90%, or well, most of our customers right now, 90% is really focused on time series data from a variety of sources. And we work with a lot of the data historians, like Pi Systems, SAP, and all these. And once we get these data, we integrate it with our data machine, a data system, where we look into it, clean it up, tag it, and then finally be able to utilize that for our processes. And how we're very, very different than a lot of the other folks who maybe just go in for a consulting project. We have two different layers. We call it the ML infrastructure layer, where it's really our backend infrastructure and AI learning. So we built machine training. That was the foundation of Eric's research was that this idea of this backend AI processors who can do faster training. And we built this it's built on containers so we can be built, can be hosted on the cloud or on premise for customers' data to be trained on. And then what our expert AI ML folks do is utilizing this ML infrastructure, 
train the data so we can get a POC within four to six weeks, depending on what the customers want. Another extra two weeks if they want to install what we call autonomous steer, we're right back into the control system and actually drive these assets controls. So first phase, you're absolutely right. Cleaning up data, getting that takes up a majority, about 70% of our time. And that just our customer success team. So our customer success engineer team is really that first touch point with our customer. We go in, we do a quick interview with them, understand what their process is, understand what their constraints are, and what levers they want to maximize, like yield, energy saving, cost cutting, emissions. What do they want to minimize, like uh, standardized betas, like higher variances in their operations? And then any kind of overall overdue junk. And then we also recently added another feature called soft sensors. Soft sensors being lab data. So we're working closely with our customers. The reason lab data is very different than our current major offering, our main tool is called Optimum, is lab data only takes in data every hour. So you have to make predictions and prescriptions among this hourly data information. Whereas in our current main product line of Optimum, we're taking data every two, three minutes from very different sources. Like in a very even more simple cooler for cement, we're looking at 17 fans that has different speeds and then grates that open. So we're looking at all this on a consistent two, three minutes, a few seconds, depending on sometimes if the need be data. And then we adjust our predictions and prescriptions to that versus the lab sensors. So I've started sensors for lab data. We need to understand how the data works and actually make predictions based upon this subset of only 20 minutes to an hour of lab data. And we make recommendations based on that. And then finally, like I alluded to, the computer vision portion, we have a, a very strong team of computer vision experts here. And what we do is we're looking at consistent images that's being taken by a machine. And we segmented each of this out. And then by looking at a heat map, we then do a bound box and say, this is where we feel a potential defect is. So we do major defects and minor defects. So this is being rolled out in, in steel and hot rolled and also in cement and looking at these defects. And we're looking to some other industries right now with chemicals. How do you actually defect this through images? And that feeds back into the decision systems of how do you calibrate each of the levers to make sure the product is at its finest level. And you touched on a few points, but let's zoom in a bit on Patreon's platform. What yeah. are some of the practical tools? Maybe go through what type of data sources and then how in the end it's the output put in production for some of the use cases. Our ML platform is pretty much built on the parallel ML research and we adapt that through open sources and other elements, all the way from taking raw data into actually deploying it and then continuous monitoring it. So the ML infrastructure has multiple components. The major one is the data machine where we take in the data and clean it up to be ready to process. So we're able to take streaming data, that's time series, control systems, historians, unstructured with images, structured databases, and then machine generated data, also including audio as well. All this can be handled by our ML infrastructure. And then our data machine, like I said, takes that in and we have what we call processor blocks. Processor blocks are pre-built AI ML building blocks that either from generic ones for like clean data, merge roles, remove columns, you know, very simple kind of data cleaning mechanisms to more advanced ones, or we use previously generated, we call these few blocks where we take in and understood how you clean up the data within the industrial space and we generated these pre-built blocks that takes in these data and configures it in a way that's usable. And then our MLEs come in and actually work with the cleaned up data to really start developing the AI ML algorithms. Once they are done, they will then train it onto our ML infrastructure. And what it does is we do this distributed training, so it allows it to be faster. So in a typical customer, they might take three, four days, you know, sometimes if it's large amounts of data, sometimes up to two weeks, we can do this within a day or, or less. Once that's done, we run it in our simulator. So we have a simulator in most of these industries to see how that is playing out. Once we kind of 
feel that we will MLEs go in, machine learning engineers, MLEs go in and actually tune, tune the data, tune the algorithm, tune it right to make sure we hit the optimal level we want for uh, using the simulators. Once that's done, we will showcase that to the customer. We'll say, here's what it is. This is the historical data you've given us. Next phase is let us tackle a live streaming data that you guys have, and we'll show you how our predictions, prescriptions are coming out. And then once they feel comfortable, we'll run it within a couple of days in their live environment. Once they're ready, we'll then, if they want to, we'll install a, our AI autonomous running component. So we call it supervised steer because there should be always be a human in the middle. We want to make sure we are still keeping human in power that he or she can see what's going on and have the ability to either turn on or off or change the adjustments. I think that's a key point. A lot of customers are needing this kind of training wheels when they feel comfortable before they turn on this autonomous steer. And even when they are, we always, and they always want to have some type of human in the middle in the loop to make sure, you know, the operations are done in a way that's acceptable. What we observe though, once the autonomous steer is configured and ready, humans really don't do too much, but you know, they are, we have a dashboard, they view it a couple of times an hour and make sure everything's running smoothly. Our outputs, we're seeing up to about 7% from energy savings and yield improvements from, from our customers, which in the industrial space, when we talk to our customers, this is game changing. A current generation advanced process control APCs will only yield you about 3 to 4%. So we're almost double that already just by adding an AI component, the software component piece on top of the current hardware. Once we hit that and they're seeing these optimal levels, usually the operators are fairly hands-off and allow the, our optimum product line to just kind of run this really uh, autonomously. Another thing, like I said, I alluded to the ML infrastructure is built off of containers. We purposely made it a lot, very dynamic. Once you have a virtual container environment, you can install it. We, right now, mostly in, in our SaaS product. So customers use this through the cloud. We usually host it on the big guys of AWS, Microsoft Azure, and so forth. But if they want to, we can actually install on-premise. What our customer success engineers do afterwards is every couple of weeks go in and tune it. They sometimes drift within the the algorithm. So, you know, we work with the customers. We usually sign some type of service level agreement. We go in, we yeah, help tune it. Our back end also has a mechanism where we do hyper tuning parameters and we do ability to explainable AI where we actually can see what's happening behind the scenes. So then our MLEs can see what's happening and then also explain to our customers how these AI MLs are really driving their assets or their processes. Henry, you alluded a little bit to it, but what type of companies leverage Petuum today? And could you share some concrete success stories? So the public ones right now is Semex. They're the second, third largest cement manufacturers in the world. We actually published a case study with them. That's the one where the customer is saying they have up to 7% in energy and yield optimization. We're also working with them on some other use cases where logistics, where you can look into how do you make sure that gets deployed to the right site and faster. So you're not just spending a lot of time on the road. So the way cement works is once that's ready, you have these special trucks that keep spinning it because you don't want cement to dry. Our main focus, like I said, is in the industrial space is basic materials, oil and gas, chemicals, and logistics. In medical, some of our customers in Asia Pacific, they provided us with chest x-rays and using a computer vision, we able to break down, segment each of that down and actually conclude, I think up to 18, potential ailments based upon these chest x-rays. And that's our software on top of it. And we jointly partner with the device manufacturer company where they actually sell these devices and utilize our AI technology on top of that. So they're doing more on the simpler scans. But once we also provide that second opinion, look into how does that chest x-ray look into if a AI, top of the line AI gave that kind of analysis. Oh, sorry. One other one was the airline I talked about. This is one of our recent customers, and they are the airline. We're on a hiatus, unfortunately, of course, with COVID-19. But before, when we were driving forward, was a lot, they were one of the top global hubs for airlines. And they have an issue where gates are not being utilized optimally. Let me get into a very interesting factor about this. is In North America, at least U.S., airlines buy gates a United airline or Delta airline will reserve certain gates, like one to 20 for themselves. But other parts of the world, 
gates are open and first come first serve or some type of algorithm. So for these ones, our AI is amazing because no longer are you bounded to, hey, it's, you know, first, let's just say American Airlines comes in first and then Delta Airlines, then Singapore Airlines and, and all these other ones. How do you make sure that the gate, right gate is the best one? And that's when we engaged with this customer and they showed us all this and we figured, wow, this is actually a very AI problem. And we tackled it with reinforcement learning and simulators to actually say, this is what we particularly see in this airport. And by building off of this, this is, will be the optimal solution. So then the gates will be utilized at a higher frequency. It will be more geared towards where we see traffic coming from. Let's just say there's a transfer from Hong Kong to Germany, and there is a transfer flight from those that we can calculate out. This is a historical, usually a lot of people utilize this airport from these two destinations. So they should be using this closest gate. So from all these data, from factors of where are the transfer data points coming from, how many people are probably walking through this airport, which gates would be the most optimal for them, and then calibrate that into which airplanes are coming in, which ones are delayed to make sure the gates are being optimally used. So that's one of our very fascinating use cases. And it's, it's ongoing work, though it's slowed down recently with COVID-19, but we hope things pick up very, very rapidly. Henry, going back to the industrial space, how do companies work with the Petrum? What does an implementation look like? We actually have a program called the Pathfinder program. It's only available for initial customer for one machine asset. And then we'll work with you to get into production and operationalize everything within four to eight weeks, depending on how complicated your system is. Everything is dependent on our customer success engineer team. So they take this data, clean it up, understand it, and use tags so they understand what the actual data points are, and then pass it on to our MLEs or machine learning engineers, our kind of AI PhDs to understand what this means, and they'll build these models or tweak it to the necessary, and then hand it back to our customer success engineers team who present it, and then finally integrate it within their control systems if they need to. The integrated control systems sometimes last about two, extra two weeks or three weeks, depending on how complex it is. Or if they don't choose to, we just kind of stop there and give them prescriptions where we turn them on, we install in the environment and give them dashboards so they can see what's kind of happening under the hood. And this is what the assets are and these are where the predictions and prescriptions are. An operator can go on and actually turn on and off these components. Henry, I would like to end with some thoughts on how manufacturers that rely on legacy equipment and processes yep. start on a path to become more data and AI driven. I think many customers already have what they need. They already have the data. They're not collecting it or they're not cleaning it or they haven't been able to corral it into a usable format. I think that's the toughest part. Customers really need to understand AI is not magic. It's built on computer science, mathematics, and statistics, and, and a very complicated algorithms. So for that to work, you need to have good understanding how your own processes should be optimized, what constraints are, and what data points are coming in. Henry, this was very interesting. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Chip. Hopefully this was enlightening and you guys learned a little bit more about Petrum and the industrial AI space. Let's wrap it up with my three takeaways on AI in the industrial space and manufacturing. Number one, there are many point use cases of AI in manufacturing, ranging from applications that are not exclusive to manufacturing, such as demand forecasting and smart warehousing, to applications that are very specific, such as predictive maintenance and quality inspection. Number two, one of the biggest promises of AI, however, is to power and enable Industry 4.0 or smart manufacturing. With the digitization of the manufacturing process, a significant amount of data is generated by connected products, assets, sensors, and processes. AI is in the best position to support and enhance decision-making based on this wealth of data. It also has the added benefit of managing the transition once experienced operators retire and are replaced with less experienced ones. Petium's autonomous steering is a great such example. Number three, will AI enable full lights out factories, 
manufacturers with full automation and no human intervention. Despite the huge progress of AI and robotics, for many manufacturing processes, full automation is far from being a reality. Even Tesla had to scale back their hyper-automation plans. Robot dexterity, task complexity, and computer vision are some of the known challenges. These are also fields where AI progresses in leaps and bounds, and a full automation future might come to life sooner than we think. 